Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, we spotlight our ASL interpreter here. We are so glad that you could join us for our webinar focused on equitable practices for transitioning employees out of your company in a world where more discussions are held remotely. My name is Tiffany Hansen. I am the Outreach and Engagement Manager for Luna Language Services. If you're not familiar with Luna, Luna provides language translation and interpretation services in over 200 languages, including American Sign Language or ASL. You'll notice we have a fabulous ASL interpreter, Naomi, with us this morning. As we get started, we will spotlight Naomi so that all attendees will receive the benefit of accessing ASL interpreting services throughout the presentation. Our other honored speaker this morning is Brian Shoemaker, Outreach Education Coordinator for the Indianapolis District of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Brian has been working with the EEOC since 2001 and regularly presents outreach programs on the EEOC laws and regulations, as well as respectful workplace training to private companies and advocacy groups. Just a quick note to get us started. If you have a question throughout the presentation, please feel free to utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit that. If we have time, we will address all questions at the end of the presentation. With that being said, Brian, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Tiffany. I, I appreciate that. And um, I wanna thank you for, um, and Luna for, for hosting this webinar today. What I'd like to talk about today and what, um, and what Tiffany will be talking about a little bit later on is um, dealing with issues of transitioning your employees. And it's not always a fun thing to talk about, but it is something that we want to talk about so that if there is an issue or if you have to do something like a layoff or a reduction in force, that you're doing it correctly and that you're doing it um, within the regulations of federal law. The first thing I would tell you is that if you are starting the process of doing layoffs or a reduction in force, the first thing that you would like that you should be doing is going to the EOC's website. The EOC has tons of information on its website regarding layoffs, regarding reduction in forces, and it's really a uh, it's jam packed with information for you. So if something isn't covered today that I don't cover today and you still have questions about that, you can either talk to me afterwards um, or email me afterwards or go to the EOC's website, www.eeoc.gov and they have lots of information on this subject. And that should be your primary source for, um, for anything related to uh, layoffs and reduction forces. So the first thing I'd, I'd tell you to do is when you're in this situation, and like I said, it's not a good situation, but when you come and find yourself in a situation where you're starting to think about having to lay off or having a reduction in force, the first thing that you wanna do is you want to find out what criteria are you going to use for your decision to, to lay off the individuals or to have a reduction in force. And that criteria is really important. The criteria should be job related and it should be consistent with business necessity. So what we're not trying to do is just say, uh, you know what, we need to lay off a few people. Let's just you know, start taking the pen and crossing out names. We don't wanna be doing something like that. What we wanna do is first figure out what criteria we wanna use and make sure that that criteria fits in with the needs of the company. Why are you using that criteria? What's, what is the decision for making that particular decision and that criteria important? It could be based on quality of work. It could be based on quantity of work. What we want though is to make sure that it's not based on a discriminatory reason. And that includes retaliation. So you don't want to take this as a time to retaliate or select employees because they reported discrimination in the past, participated in a discrimination investigation, or maybe they opposed discrimination. Okay, you do not want to use that as the criteria for selecting employees for a layoff. But you do want to use a criteria that is consistent um, with your business necessity and also job related. And the reason we do this in the first place is because of a theory of discrimination that the EOC is using. The, the EOC uses a couple theories of discrimination. 
Um, adverse impact is the theory that we are thinking about right now. And what adverse impact really is, it's a neutral pal policy or practice that, that really disproportionately selects, uh, or excuse me, uh, excludes members of a protected group. So it's a policy that on the face of it looks like it's completely non-discriminatory. But as it plays out, it does in fact exclude a group of, uh, of individuals that are in a protected group. And so what is that protected, what are those protected groups? Well, protected groups are things like race, color, religion, sex, which includes pregnancy, national origin, disability, age, which is older than 40, or genetic information. So if your um, criteria impacts those particular basis of, or those protected groups in an adverse way, it could have, your policy could have an adverse impact on that, and it could be a discriminatory practice. So the important thing to remember is that when you're, lo that when you're looking at the theory of uh, adverse impact, if you were to have a policy that, that excludes a group or, uh, or members of a protected group, the EEOC is going to look at a couple things. They're going to look at, was your criteria was it job related and consistent with business necessity? And that's why in the last slide I told you, you need to come up with a criteria first. It's because the EOC is gonna look at that criteria and we're gonna see was it job related and was it consistent uh, with business necessity? And we're going to look if there was a less discriminatory alternative that could have been used. So instead of the, the criteria you used, was there a less discriminatory practice or criteria that could have been used that is still job related and consistent with business necessity and would have achieved the same results, okay? And so those are the things that we're gonna look at. And so I advise you that if you're sitting down and looking at the criteria, think about those particular um, issues as well. Is there a less discriminatory alternative or is this uh, job related and consistent with business necessity? And so one of the ways that you would find out whether or not this could have an adverse impact on groups is to list the employees who are going to be laid off. And this is important. You want to make sure that once you come up with that criteria, start listing the employees that would be covered or would, that would fit that criteria, and then start looking at their protected basis. All too often, employers um, you know, figure out the criteria and then they send that criteria off to their frontline supervisors or their department heads and everybody does their own thing. And then the leadership doesn't know exactly who is even being let go or being uh, uh, laid off. They're relying on their frontline managers or their department heads. It's a better idea to list those employees first and to get a good understanding of how your criteria is going to impact your entire workforce. And that way you can make changes if necessary, or you can, you know, be satisfied that this is a good criteria to use and it's going to be working for you. But you need to list your employees. You need to look at the employees and see who is going to be affected in this. Once you've listed your employees, then you can start to figure out which groups are going to be deter which groups are going to be affected more than other groups and a, you know in a perfect situation there wouldn't be one group that's affected more um, and the question i get most often is how do we know that that a group is being affected more than another group and the best way to do that is really just to compare uh, the percentages of your employees so you'd want to you'd want to compare one group the makeup of your workforce and you'd want to compare that to that uh, and, and find a, con, a percentage of how much that particular workforce is affected by your criteria. So in an in, in example, I'm using uh, males and uh, females. What you would do is you would look at how many females make up your workforce, and in this example it would be 30%, and then you would find that your criteria, how much, how many females are affected by your criteria, and in this case it was 85% of females are affected by your uh, criteria. And so when you're looking at those percentages, you know, the math isn't that important. Um, what I want you to think about is, you know, how many people are being affected and is it, does it seem, um, does it seem unfair? Does there, does there seem to be an issue? Because if you look at the same criteria, you can see that, 
all right, if females made up 30% of your workforce and males make up 70 and your criteria is affecting uh, women, uh, 85% of the women employees, but only 15% of the male employees. And so you can see that there may be a problem or a difference there. Once you look at that, then you can start saying, well, is there another, another criteria that we could use? Or maybe you can even see, you can start asking yourself, why is that group affected more? And I'm giving you a, a kind of a real life example is a lot of times um, we see that the underlying reason why in a group is affected more than another group is because of some discriminatory actions that were taking place well before the layoff was going to happen. Um, one of the examples that, that I can think of that's a, that's a good example is a lot of times companies will use training. So the amount of training uh, an employee has, that determines where they are on the, the layoff status or the RIF status. And pe employees with more training, then they aren't laid off or they're laid off at a different uh, time, a later time than employees with less training. And what we can sometimes think about, or, and in this one example I'm thinking about, was that training was given to male employees at a greater rate than female employees. So even if female employees wanted training, they weren't getting it at the same rate as male employees. So then they use that criteria. And you can see that there was an underlying reason, a discriminatory reason of why uh, females were, uh, were, were laid off at a higher rate. And so you want to look at, um, you want to look at why that may have happened. Another reason could even be um, hiring practices. A lot of companies have the first in, uh, first out type of policy, right? You're, you were, or I'm sorry, um, last in, first out. So you're the last person hired, so you're the first person that's going to be laid off. One of the problems with that is, is that if you've, you've made a commitment to change your hiring practices, and so that now uh, in the past year or so that you've determined that you're going to be more, um, you're going to cast a bigger net, you're going to get more diverse workforce, what we find is that the first in may be the most diverse workforce, uh, well, I'm sorry, the, the last in may be the most diverse workforce, and those are the people that you are now laying off. So is there another criteria that you could use that would have less of an impact on a protected group? And that's what we're going to look at next. Can you adjust your criteria? Okay, can you adjust the criteria so that the, it is still business related, right? Um, and um, but instead of affecting one group more than another, is there a way that you can adjust it so that every group is affected uh, in the same rate? Is it fair while still meeting your business's needs? What you don't want to do, and I'll just give you a quick, um, a quick example of what you don't want to do, is you don't want to try to bank up that difference by picking people that weren't impacted. So in that example with uh, the females, there are more females that were impacted, impacted. You don't wanna then just say, oh, you know what, let's just grab a bunch of male employees and throw them in and that'll balance everything out, okay? You do not wanna do that. You wanna make sure that the criteria is the same and that you're not trying to make up the difference by grabbing members of another group and putting them in the RIF or the layoff. And then finally, what I want you to think about is documenting the process. It's so important that everything that you do is documented so that if somebody comes to you and makes a complaint um, or if, if a federal agency starts knocking at your door, you have documents that you can show them, well, here's the reason, here's why it's uh, uh, consistent with business necessity and job related. And um, you know, here's the criteria that we used and here's all the procedures and, and this is what we looked at and we listed all the employees and we made all these decisions. If you have all those documents and you're able to provide them uh, to the EEOC or to any other group, um, that's gonna be very helpful to you. Documenting the process can be also be very helpful to ensure that managers that are the ones that are involved in the layoff uh, selection criteria understand what you are actually looking for. And so that when you start putting your criteria down on paper and giving it to those managers who are now in charge of making those selections, they understand exactly what they are selecting for. And it's not just a free for all, or it's not just giving them permission to lay off whoever they want. Okay. There's a documented process and the criteria is in writing that so it can be used um, accurately and consistently throughout the process. 
So now what I'd like to do is just pass it back to um, Tiffany, and she's going to talk uh, a little bit more about some um, inclusive communication strategies that you can use. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so there are a lot of folks joining us today who are here locally and who may be familiar with Luna, but we also have some folks um, from a more national audience. So I just wanted to give a very brief background of some of the work that I do. I know a lot of folks are familiar with the EEOC, so may be familiar with some of the work that Brian regularly does. Um, but with Luna Language Services as an Outreach and Engagement Manager, do a lot of advocacy work in the community for diversity inclusion for the protected classes that Luna serves. So Luna serves people from different national origins, which is a protected class. And we also serve people with disabilities with all of the work that we do with the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, me personally, I uh, work with a lot of local nonprofit and advocacy organizations, including the Indiana Latino Expo, which is one of our largest Latino advocacy groups here locally, in addition to um, the Diversity Roundtable of Central Indiana, which provides regular diversity and inclusion um, training for folks here locally. Uh, Brian was actually a fabulous speaker for us in January. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I've been so excited to work with Brian and the EEOC to bring up some topics of some populations and protected classes that may not be brought up quite as often. Next slide. So just to give you a, a really basic overview of what the language landscape looks like here in central Indiana, um, we do host people from uh, different global locations who speak over 100 different languages across our region. So it is pretty diverse here in central Indiana. Uh, we also, one statistic that I like to throw out there regularly is that 13.5% of the residents here in Marion County speak a language other than English in the home. Um, this was a statistic that came out of um, some census work, some an ACS survey that was done within the past two years. So it's the most up-to-date information that we have, but can just give you an idea of just how many people speak different languages here in a major metropolitan area like Indianapolis. Um, and I've got some major languages listed there for you. So one thing that I would suggest for you to do with your current population base is to not just think about how many people um, speak no English, but think about how many people in your workforce have a different native language where maybe they don't always catch all of the vocabulary and terminology that you're using in English. Um, and just make a list of what those languages might be so that you can understand what the language landscape of your organization might look like. Next slide. So one of the things that we've been talking with folks a lot about are some of the support materials that you may be providing to your employees as you're transitioning them out of um, your specific workplace. So thinking about translating some of those support materials, um, one of the things that I like to bring up that I kind of mentioned in the last slide was that language comprehensive or language is truly, language comprehensive is truly a spectrum. So just because someone speaks enough English to talk to you about their day or their family or to do the basic necessities of their job, that doesn't always mean they understand all of the terminology that you're talking to them about, especially when you're talking about benefits or complicated paperwork that they need to be filling out. So translating some of these documents that you are handing to every single employee that's going through this process can be really helpful and important for some of those non-native English speakers to connect with that information and really understand it. Um, and just a note, translation can also include ASL interpreting. Uh, so as we're watching Naomi do a fabulous job, um, American Sign Language is very, very different than the English language. A lot of grammar that goes into American Sign Language is performed by facial expressions, um, things like that, things that, that in English would be um, the written word. So while 
uh, English written documents may be helpful and may kind of get the job done. We view that as kind of the bare minimum for providing information to our deaf and hard of hearing employees, as American Sign Language would definitely be the more appropriate um, and accurate language to use when communicating with these employees. Um, so just a couple of things to think about as far as providing translation or interpreting for some of these, um, these support resources is information about what that transition timeline might look like. Um, if people are going to continue to have benefits, what benefits are they going to continue to have and for what period of time? If you have EAP services and mental health support, uh, making sure that you're communicating the access to those resources in those different languages and also checking with your provider to ensure that if you do have uh, some an ASL user or a Spanish speaker that calls to UC services that um, that they're going to be able to provide services in those language. Spoiler alert, they're required to. <laughs> so likely they already have that set up for you and they may even have helpful resources for you to provide to your employees that are already translated or interpreted. So that could be really helpful. Um, the last is thinking about unemployment information. Brian, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, this is a screenshot from the Indiana Department of Workforce Development and some of the unemployment information that they have listed there. Um, unemployment can be really challenging to understand, especially right now as rules are changing, applications may be tricky or people have lots of questions. Um, the uh, DWD here in Indiana does have a couple of Spanish um, resources on their website. So if you do have native Spanish speakers in your organization, you, it may be helpful for you to download these and share those with them. Um, if you do need to, I would really love to see kind of a frequently asked questions about um, unemployment translated into a couple of other more prominent languages, but that may be something that your company may be able to do on your own if you have a very diverse language group in your workforce. Next slide. So career transition services. Um, I was speaking recently with a good friend of mine who works with Purple Inc, which is a local HR consulting company. Um, and we were talking about outplacement services. She gave me some of these helpful statistics as far as why outplacement services or um, even just doing some of these things in, in, internally can be really helpful um, and can produce a return on investment for your company. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention here, um, a pro tip, if you're reacting to a shift in the economy and or public health concerns, building relationships with temporary staffing companies may allow you to shift your employees to a current need with the hope of having a percentage of them return. Um, I also work very closely with a local staffing company called the Morales Group talked to them several weeks ago and one of the things that they were doing was simply pivoting employees from one employer to another as one employer was shutting down or ramping down their employees and another one um, had more of an immediate need. So as the time balances out, um, hopefully being able to transition those employees back to the original employer as things change so that you don't have to spend money um, hiring a whole new workforce again. Next slide. So here is just some, um, some information about remote conversations and how to make sure that those are accessible. So providing interpreters for live conversations containing sensitive information um, to ensure communication is 100% understood. Again, this goes back to understanding that language comprehension is definitely a spectrum. Um, so if you're calling out to people over the telephone, you can usually, you can access interpreters over the phone. This is an on-demand service essentially um, where you would use a hotline to call in to request an interpreter. Um, the cost is per minute, so the investment can be very small just to be able to have that little bit of immediate access that you need. 
Um, and with services like Luna, you're going to have multiple languages available. Luna has over 200 languages available. So it does allow you, especially for some of our community partners who do have a ton of languages represented in their workforce or with the consumers that they're working with, it can be really helpful to be able to make sure you've covered all your bases. Um, with virtual interpreting, this is going to be just like we've done today, having uh, an interpreter join a virtual meeting or um, virtual announcements. So that's something where you would schedule that ahead of time so that's not an on-demand service. There is for, you know, um, or nationwide with most of the providers, you're going to be looking at a two hour minimum for that. So you're typically going to use this for a longer conversations or for um, if you can block a couple of conversations in a row together with the same language group. And then this is absolutely ideal for American Sign Language users, again, to make sure that they fully comprehend any of the sensitive information that you're delivering to them. Another pro tip when we're thinking about compliance, um, using a third party interpreter uh, or provider will ensure that the language is accurate and will also maintain confidentiality with your employees. So we know that our first go to is to use an internal employee who is bilingual, but when you're talking about conversations that are this sensitive in nature, it's really important to make sure that you have that third party person to make sure the information is accurate and also to protect the employee. Next slide. Um, here's just a little bit more information about things you should be considering with career transition or outplacement, whether you're doing this internally or hiring a provider externally. Um, thinking about guidance on job search navigation. Can you schedule virtual appointments like this and walk people through a website? Can you provide an interpreter for them while you do that? Um, same thing with interview coaching. If you're going to do that virtually or over the phone, making sure that that's accessible. Uh, resume tips, that would be an easy document that you likely already have that you can translate into other languages. Um, and then career coaching, again, if you have tips for these that are already um, laid out in a document, you could translate that. If you have live folks working with other people, then um, making sure that those meetings are accessible and inclusive as well. Another pro tip here, if you are utilizing an outside vendor, ask them if they are capable of providing their services equitably to your whole workforce, letting them know which languages are represented, and request that they build any language considerations into your quote so that you have all of your bases covered. Next slide. Um, the last thing is thinking about accessible announcements. So we're seeing a lot of folks who are providing video and major announcements about their company um, via video. So thinking about this in um, making sure that this is accessible for our deaf and hard of hearing community, uh, the bare minimum would be to provide captions in English or um, the simplest thing is even to just provide a transcript below the video. Um, you should provide ASL services if your resources will allow that. And then also thinking if you're already going to um, provide the transcript in English, translating that transcript into Spanish or any of the other languages that are within your workforce or within the community that you're trying to reach can be very easy and inexpensive. Last slide. So with that, um, we're right up against our half hour time frame. I'm pretty proud of that, <laughs> considering how much I love to talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions about any of the information that you've been presented today? Uh, any of the suggestions, um, possibly questions about compliance? Looks like we don't have any submitted. What I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna follow up with everyone who has registered for the webinar via email, hopefully today, if not early tomorrow. And what I'll do is I will um, provide a recording of this webinar so that if you would like to share that with 
any of your team members or any of your colleagues, that information can be easily shared. Um, I'm going to copy Brian on that email. So if you have any additional questions for Brian about any of these compliance issues or just making sure that you're doing the right thing, he'll be included on that email. And of course, you can email me as well if you have any questions about any of the language access points that we brought up today. So with that, thank you for joining us. Brian, thank you so much for presenting as well. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> and Naomi, thank you for interpreting. Um, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you.